Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconan, along with Brianna Valeski, and we have Angie Setzer on the line. She's the Vice President of Grain for Citizens Elevator. She's also na uh, known as the Goddess of Grain on Twitter, if you want to follow her. But, Angie, we have to congratulate you uh, on your recent marriage to Carl. Thank you. Yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of folks didn't realize uh, Carl and I... Carl Setzer and I, regular guests also on the show, have had a relationship for a while now, and uh, we don't always agree, but I guess if your biggest fight around whether or not you should be bullish or bearish the gray market, you're you're in for the long haul. So we, we got that going for us. Yeah, Brianna came over to me, and she had this big smile on her face, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> she's like, what? She's, and I'm like, did they meet on our show? I mean, are we like, you know, because of the... Yeah. It, it, no. You're, well, it didn't hurt, that's for sure. So, yeah, we uh, we started talking, and, and uh, the rest is history. It was so. from our show? It wasn't, you didn't know him beforehand? No, we knew each uh, other beforehand, but it helped. Uh, the, the show helped to kind of continue uh, that conversation side. Hey. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, in the Jewish uh, in the Jewish tradition, when, uh, you know, someone, you know, helps make a match, that the people that do it are supposed to get a watch. Did you know that? Oh, okay. No. <laughs> well, if you email me your address later. We'll send you something right over. <laughs> no, no. No, congrats. No, because I was just cracking up because I, you know, I call him the, you know, you're the goddess of grain. I call him the king of corn. And, you know, we didn't. Yep. <laughs> we did. That's what we laugh about it all the time. That's what I tell him. He's, he's my bear, though. He's my, I'm always the optimistic one, it seems. And, and he's. He says he's realistic, not pessimistic. So that's what we always we always joke that that uh, you know. And then our kids are probably going to have to be agronomists too, just because we're we're grain traders. So we're going to need someone to help us out on the the growing side of the the crop. All right, let's get to the important stuff. We've had some reports that, uh, in the commodities markets. Why don't you walk us through a couple of the reports, what the results, and what you're looking going forward. Well, we've seen uh, the hardest part this year, and it's been kind of a continued thing that I've been talking about, is, is we know when, when dry and hot weather hits um, that it damages the crop or the potential crop that you have out there. Well, this year it's been the opposite. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of rain, um, flooding rain in a lot of areas and, and different things like that. Well, the USDA historically has, has struggled with determining what yield and production potential looks like in a, a wet year. Um, so that's where we're at right now is uh, what the trade thinks um, and what the USDA has had to say has, has differed, you know, substantially. And, and that's really what's kind of um, kicked grains in the teeth and soybeans there over the last month or so is going into the August report. It was almost a, a deja vu all over again versus the March report where we, we had this bullish expectation going in um, that the USDA would make adjustments that would, would cut production potential for both corn and soybeans, and uh, they came out and said, ah, nah, not yet. Um, so last month, everyone was expecting a, a big cut to soybean acres due to the flooding rains that we saw, um, and we had a substantial over a quarter of uh, intended bean acres still unplanted as of July 1st, which, uh, for those of you who are like, okay, what does that mean? Uh, after, at the tail end of June into July, you really see a, a significant cut to uh, yield potential. So to, to have all these acres unplanted and, and this, that, and the other thing going on, everyone had anticipated the USDA would cut production um, and subsequently cut you know, overall supply and, and carry out, and they didn't. Uh, they actually increased it for both corn and soybeans pretty substantially again. And that's just, that teamed up with, you know, the overall everyone hates commodities this, you know, this quarter. Uh, sort of feeling has really pushed grains down to soybeans have, have achieved new lows more than once. Wheat's been, been laying there flat like a slug and corn's been struggling to get any sort of higher interest as, as well. Okay, before we go into the uh, individual uh, commodities themselves, taking a look at the technicals, uh, my first question is, you know, sometimes or usually you have some chaos in the markets. You know, sometimes some of the money leaves the markets and goes into the commodities markets. And mm -hmm. looking at some of these charts here, I just don't know if that's happening. No, it, we have not seen it happen yet, and that's what we thought you'd, we'd see. Is you know, a lot of times people will discuss that as the the flight to quality. Um, you know, they'll say or or uh, you know, in times of uncertainty, you want to buy something you can hold. Um, and we we haven't seen that. 
Um, but I think the, the hardest part is, is every time that we've seen anyone, any sort of outside money flow come in due to the, the potentially bullish headline sort of deal that we see develop ahead of reports or something like that, anytime we get a good chunk of buyers come in, um, you know, they, they get the ball dropped on them. You know, the USC will come out with something that, that's not quite as, as bullish as what was expected. You know, next thing we know, the, the market's down substantially. Um, so I can't blame them for not diving in head first, especially when every time you turn around, um, there's a continued discussion over how much, you know, grain and, and soybeans and everything um, from that standpoint we have on hand. I mean, the, the extremely high prices we saw happen after the 2012 drought um, really encouraged global growth. Um, the fact that we really haven't seen any substantial production loss take place due to a weather issue or something like that and all of the other um, growing community or growing countries that we have, you know, Brazil, Argentina, Ukraine, Russia, China, even, um, you know, if you listen to them, has, has, has had another record growing season. Um, the only issue we saw was some drought develop in Europe, but it wasn't enough to, to get anyone excited on, on this side. So, I mean, I can't blame them for not coming in. I, I think there are some great opportunities in corn, um, but it's hard to, to tell someone, oh, yeah, come on in and, and buy like the devil because it's going to go up when every day or every time we try to, to test any sort of resistance, level, resistance levels or do anything exciting, we end up you know, closing lower. Yeah, and I did. We're trying to build this support here. I've seen it uh, in August, and then we came back down here in September. It looks like you got a pretty nice range here. It looks like uh, three sixty mm-hmm. on the downside, three seventy five on the upside. So I guess you just kind of yeah. just got to play around those parameters. Uh, what about the weather? I mean, we had a pretty hot summer here in the Motor City. We also did mm-hmm. have some rain. Has there been you know any anything in the prior weather or the rather weather moving forward that uh, might give a little boost to the uh, to the grain grain complex. Well, that's, it's like we talked about with the the too wet in some areas, and then you know the one thing that no one really talked about a whole lot was the hottest one of the hottest weeks of the year um, took place around the time that corn was pollinating. Uh, that was in the the second week of July, there first week of July. Um, you know, and, and like I said before, the the crop itself, the plant. Um, never showed any struggle. I mean, all year long we had enough rain and enough heat to where you drove around. I mean, I drove from Michigan to Iowa about five different times this summer, and it looked great. Um, But what we're seeing now is there were some issues where if you get too hot and you don't have um, decent nighttime temperatures, you can run into where the corn puts the ear on when it's pollinating. Um, It doesn't build that maximum yield potential. So we have seen some of that. Um, and the one thing that will be really interesting to see what happens is corn, again, likes to kind of go, you know, coast into the finish, like running a marathon. Um, you know, it, it's really not going to, it doesn't like to be stressed as it, it finishes. It can cause some issues with kernel depth and test weight and things like that, which do impact overall yield eventually. Um, and we did see, you know, the longest stretch of 90-degree days took place in a lot of places last week. Um, so when the crop's supposed to be, you know, just finishing slowly, you know, you, you, you want it to, to kind of just relax into the finish and, and slowly finesse or, or die, basically, so you can harvest it, um, it was rushed to the finish with that heat. Um, and then on top of that, we saw some soybeans where your top end yield was probably taken out. Um, you know, you, you lose some pods, you lose some bean, bean growth and things like that because of that heat. But, again, it goes back to until the combines run, um, we can only speculate as to what, you know, damage was done, if, if any. Um, so we just kind of sit and wait. Now, to the north of here, because I'm out in central, north central Iowa, um, now uh, my new office is, is working from home, but um, out here to our north, uh, there were some instances of frost and, and things like that in South, parts of South Dakota, North Dakota, um, and there's some thought we could see some in Minnesota, um, potentially in parts of Wisconsin, perhaps. And, uh that will also can, can cause some issues with test weight and, and overall bean, you know, the ability for the bean crop to finish. So it'll be something we'll have to watch. Um, but unfortunately, I, I really don't expect the USDA to make any sort of major adjustments today on that, uh, just because from an information flow, um, you know, until we get the combines going, there's nothing really new to, to have them adjust, I guess. Uh, just looking at, you know, at, 
you know, things that are going on in the market. Obviously, you have to you pay attention to the stock market. I know we talked to you about that. Um, you know, the situation mm-hmm. going on over there in China. Um, now, I'd, yeah. uh, you'll, you'll have to you have to educate me. Uh, you know, as far as <laughs> next neck ex, exporters. I, I yeah, go ahead. Just give me comments on that. Oh. Yeah, well, China has been our number one importer of corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, sorghum, you know, milo there, just about everything, of course, just like anything else has been the big buyer. Um, and we've been playing the Chinese slowdown game in soybeans now um, for approximately 18 months, maybe two years. It's getting to where, you know, eventually we will see that slowdown, darn it, but we, we haven't. Um, and so that's been the one thing that we've seen is all commodities have sold off due to this whole idea that China's, you know, not going to want them. Um, and then the funniest part is, is just three weeks ago, two weeks ago, we get an overall assessment of their July import. They're, they're record high. Um, you know, now granted, they're not necessarily coming from the U.S. based on the competition that we've seen elsewhere and the collapse in the real out of Brazil and, and the Argentinian currency down there and things like that. That's made, made it difficult. Um, but the, the hardest part in grains, especially corn and wheat, um, in wheat alone, the USDA forecasts China is sitting on 40% of the global wheat stock. Um, you know, about 5 billion bushel is, is what the USDA says they're sitting on. And then with corn, it's a, it's a whole huge number again, um, in addition to that. Well, the million dollar question, in my opinion, is, is how it's sitting quality wise. And a lot of folks have discussed that they're concerned we're going to see this outflow of grains come out of China. Um, well, right now their corn price is, is, you know, $9 and some odd cents a bushel versus, um, you know, the global price, which is around 6 bucks once you figure in cost of freight and things like that. So, um, you know, if China's willing to take a, a $15 billion write down, um, then yeah, they're, they'll let their corn free. I doubt it. Um, and I question the quality, but, um, we've really been struggling with the China syndrome um, in grains, especially since the last spring. I mean, we were discussing um, China canceling soybean purchases and things like that last January with, with great gusto, um, and we're still waiting for it. I mean, eventually it'll show up, and then we'll have everyone telling us that they, they told us so, or perhaps eventually it'll show up. But for now, you know, their pork prices are, are soaring. Um, you know, their their in- interior costs are are increasing substantially and the quickest way to have your people turn against you is to make food too expensive and uh, I highly doubt they're going to do anything um, that's going to take away the the taste for pork and and you know just basically that western diet that they've picked up um, so I, I I keep waiting to see if the tide will turn and and will turn around but it has had a big influence on commodity prices as well. And now you said uh, the Chinese are sitting on uh, all this wheat. Is this stuff that they previously imported and they're just yeah. waiting out? Uh, uh, imported and grown. Yeah. Okay. Because they, they, they pay um, an excessive amount of money to their growers, their, their domestic farmers, um, to grow corn. Basically, they guarantee their producers there that they're going to get nine bucks a bushel on corn. Wow. Um, and then a certain amount of money on wheat. And they did it when... Um, you know, when we had the ethanol, the development of ethanol start, of course, and you see a substantial increase in demand versus what we're accustomed to from a supply standpoint, you are going to have that time period where the pipeline gets thin and, and you know, you have to sort out who's going to pay for the demand and who's going to increase that, that price enough to encourage a, an increase in supply. So we did have some little starts and stops there. Um, between, you know, that 2008 and then, of course, the drought in 2012 did not help matters. Um, you know, had it not been for that, we would have probably um, been coasting along fine for a while. But um, they got into the, the point of where they wanted to in- increase the price to encourage domestic production. Uh, they wanted to show the world that they didn't need to import grains. Well, they still need to import grains, you know, not only from a quality standpoint, um, but from a, an overall demand standpoint, they built this price up so high, um, and then at the same time they were importing, you know, substantial amounts that uh, right now, according to the USDA, they have significant stocks on hand, 
Um, but it's just like with anything else that comes out of China. You know, I hate to be the tinfoil hat wearer, but I am. <laughs> um, you know, how much of that do you rely on or trust from an accuracy standpoint? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's always one of those things where you want to watch what the, the Chinese do, not what they say. Um, you know, and, and to me, what they do indicates that they don't have near the amount on hand um, that they say. Um, but at the same time, you know, when, when your market relies on headlines or or you have to trade on, on the, the quote-unquote official information, you know, it makes it hard to, to argue that they don't necessarily have it. And uh, where's the dollar? How's the dollar coming in and playing on this? Oh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it hurts. I mean, it really hurts. Our, especially, you know, not only do we have a strong dollar, um, but with Brazil being downgraded and, and um, everything like that, they're our biggest competition out there, or one of our largest competitors when it comes to global um, global business, uh, and they've had good sized crops lately. They're one of the few countries in the world I was just reading today, you know, that still can can build um, the area that they're planting in. They have you know downgraded pasture. They have different areas, so they can continue to to grow um, what they plant and things like that. Well, uh, they have seen, um, gosh, I think it's close to a thirty percent drop in their their value of uh, the real versus the dollar over the past year. Well, of course, then is that the, the Brazilian soybean producer, and once you convert soybeans over to dollars for him, the United States producer is getting around eight fifty a bushel. Uh-huh. Um, the Brazilian producer is getting about twelve fifty. Um, and at the same time, that that same bushel on the global market um, looks a lot cheaper if bought in the Brazilian currency versus the, the dollar here. So it it's made it to where they can be exceptionally more competitive. Their grower can still receive a, a relatively solid price. They can still sell, quote unquote, cheaply into the global market, um, and it's it's made it a struggle. It's been the same, you know, when you look at the Black Sea region and wheat, um, you know, the wheat uh, sales and things like that. Um, with their currency down versus ours, it's just made it, it difficult. Our our stuff is expensive, um, so we're trying to figure out ways that we can say, hey, we can we can meet your demand, we can meet your quality specs, we can do all of this stuff. Um, that's why you want to pay a little extra. Um, but and I mean we're seeing it show up a little bit. We have seen soybean. Um, you know, at one point in time, new crop soybean sales were nearly half of what they were a year ago. Um, they're still extraordinarily slow, but over about the last month, we've seen you know 15 percent of that made up. So where we're about 33 percent below a year ago. Um, you know, and of course it's hard when Brazil has a huge crop and people are forecasting another big crop. You know, I joke it's like washcloths at Walmart. I mean, you're not going to make a run on Walmart for washcloths because you know there will always be washcloths at Walmart. And so it's hard to, to say that we're slow because there isn't any demand, um, you know, versus maybe we're slow simply because they know they will be there, um, you know, bean-wise. And until they see something different, you know, until something different is proven to them, you know, they're not going to be in a big hurry to buy. But, of course, it would be nice to, to see that dollar um, you know, weaken a little bit versus some of these other currencies and, and maybe give us a leg up on some of that competition. Uh, and before I let you go, I got to ask you about yeah. uh, the flash crash. And uh, I mean, obviously, you you know, you're in agricultural markets. I mean, what did you did you see that kind of panic and, in, in, you know, indecision mm-hmm. in that market or they're just kind of business as usual? No, we did. Um, we were a little immune to it at first. There were a few different things. Few, you know, the, the big, big crash. Um, you know, we we saw corn drop. I think about a dime, fifteen cents that day. Beans were down about thirty cents. Um, wheat was down pretty pretty strongly as well, fifteen to twenty cents. So I mean, we were down, um, but we were, were already down. Uh, you know what I mean? We right, we really okay. didn't have a, a huge level to to drop from. We did see it, and we just saw the slowdown in, in overall buying. And uh, um, you know, we're not immune to that outside stuff just because there's there's so many active hands in this. To where um, if you get a, a mindset to where everything needs to be sold, it, it will be sold, and, and we see it. But you know, I don't know if it's fortunately or unfortunately for us, we were already low enough to where um, the substantial hit. You know, basically we've been leaking air for. A year and a half yeah. now. So okay. it's it's really been one of those things where, um, you know, a lot of folks will talk about it. What does this mean if we see QE? What does it mean if the Fed raises rates? You know, how much lower can commodities go? And 
Um, maybe it's the optimist in me. You know, don't ask my husband, of course, because he'll disagree. But I think we've already kind of seen that big hit happen. Um, and now we're just waiting to, to get to where people want to buy again. And, and it'll just take a good story to, to get that encouraged, in my opinion. Is there uh, any move in the, the big commercials, any big positions, uh, you know, either way in the market, see them accumulating uh, on either side or distributing? We've seen um, some of the outside, the, the spec side of things, I guess you could call it. Um, they stick long through a lot of this. Um, you know, I didn't, I was moving last week, so I didn't get to take a look really at what they had or what they were, where they were sitting, but... Um, there has been a, an interesting development just in the sense that even with bad news, um, we've seen some people come in and, and basically buy um, with the mindset of being in it for the long haul. Um, yesterday we saw some substantial call um, call buying take place. Of course, October, we got a couple weeks on that. We saw that come up. Um, we saw some folks buying from December, um, which would show that you know they have some thought process. Perhaps we could see the market react positively to today's report. Um, and then we've seen, you know, the commercial side is my side of things, basically the elevator folks. Um, when the market rallied, they went short, of course, because as I buy grain, I, I sell it on the board to, to hedge my risk. Um, so you did see some grain buying take place and pretty substantial opportunities there. Um, you know, but we really are stuck in this no man's land purgatory side of things where you're not seeing um, an excessive amount of, of commercial activity, um, or even speculative activity just because I think everyone's waiting to see what the heck's going to happen. We've been it's like on... watching paint dry. <laughs> <laughs> We've been on the line with Angie Setzer. She is the vice president of Grain for Citizens Elevator. She's also known of the goddess of grain on Twitter if you'd like to follow her tweets. Well, congratulations. Give a shout-out to Carl. Thank and you. Uh, We're very happy for you, and we'll talk to you again soon. Really enjoyed having you on. Thank you so much. Have a great day.